morning, church. How are we doing? Welcome to Austin Ridge. I want to say good morning to Building uh, A as well. I want to say good morning to Southwest Campus. I want to say good evening to the Sunday night service. I want to say hey to the folks who may be listening to this throughout the week. So glad you're here. If you're a guest here, what we do at Austin Ridge is we take the Bible, we take a book of the Bible, and we walk through it verse by verse. Right now you're walking into, if you're, if you're a guest here today, you're walking into the Sermon on the Mount. We believe the greatest sermon ever taught, the sermon by Jesus in Matthew 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 5. Today I want to talk about a topic that I think is, is, is very, very difficult, very, very painful, very, very emotional, very, very circumstantially based. Uh, the last couple of weeks we talked about anger and we talked about lust. Those have been tough. Uh, the thing is, though, we could listen to both of those sermons, at least sit in the room and go, yeah, I struggle with anger. Yeah, I struggle with lust. Today, we're talking about the topic of divorce. And divorce is different from those two because what divorce does is it draws a line right down the center, center of our room. And half the folks statistically in our room have been divorced. I'm not necessarily just talking about y'all. And half the folks in our room statistically haven't been divorced. And the truth is we have folks who have been divorced who are very intimate with Christ and walk with him daily and love him with all their hearts. And we have folks here who have been married for decades and don't walk with God and don't treat their spouses well and aren't kind. And, but yet they can say, I, but I've never been divorced, as if that's like a badge of honor. And I think you can be a bad married person, you can be a godly divorced person. But this is a messy subject. It's a subject that most pastors don't want to delve into because... Let's be honest, the, the culture's view of sexuality, its view of marriage, its view of divorce does not go with what the Bible says about it. And so this topic brings a lot of, of frustration and anger from people. So a lot of pastors just kind of don't talk about it, just skip over it. We don't do that at Austin Ridge. That's the thing about going through a book. We just hit the next text. If some of you are guests here and you're thinking, did someone send them an email because I knew they'd talk about this if I came to church? We didn't know you were coming. That's just the next text. So again, we're in Matthew 5, and, and I want you to know it's, 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 very, it's very tough. Uh, but Jesus puts this topic in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He only talks about six topics, and the third topic he hits is divorce. So I think it's a very important topic, a topic we need clarity on, a, a topic that I think is very confusing for a lot of folks. I think divorce has become just kind of the norm in our culture. If you're not happy, God wants you to get out of that marriage. You, you know, you need to get divorced. You need to find somebody else. God wants you happy. God desires for you to be happy. God's main purpose for you is to be holy, okay? Holiness brings happiness. Sin does not bring happiness. And so we're going to kind of unpack this today. Um, my prayer in a sermon like this is that you don't hear like one phrase that bothers you and you just shut down the rest of the sermon. I just pray you'd listen to the whole sermon, maybe listen to it two or three times. And, and, and this is a sermon that, that, is, that is for you, hopefully to encourage you. So let me pray for you and we'll hit the text. Father, thank you for this incredibly uh, difficult topic in our culture. I think our culture has uh, made this topic more confusing than the Bible lays it out. And I hope today we can bring some clarity, some encouragement. I pray for friends of mine uh, on the Austin Ridge campus, on the Southwest campus, that maybe they've been through divorce, maybe they're going through divorce, and this is a painful topic. I pray you'd encourage them. I pray your mercy would overwhelm them, your grace would support them, and that you would love them deeply today, as you do. We thank you, Father, and pray that you would speak clearly to us. It's in your name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 31. It was also said, this is Jesus talking, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. I'm going to spend several minutes this morning unpacking what certificate of divorce means. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except, here's an exception clause, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I asked several staff members to take this text, and no one did, so I'm going to take it. <laughs> it's a tough text, isn't it? If what Jesus is saying is true, then half our culture, a part of that half of our culture, is doing this wrong. Here's the thing about the Sermon on the Mount, because, you know, when you, you hear that anger is murder and lust is adultery, you're thinking, I can never do this. That's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. You've got to run to the grace of God and say, I can't do this. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lust. I'm going to struggle. If left to my flesh, I'm not going to treat my spouse well. 
I need help. That's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. Folks, we're talking about a supernatural lifestyle. We're talking about the way righteous people should live in a world that's not righteous. So you can't look to our culture to get clarity on divorce because they've got it all messed up. You can't look to our culture on, on sexuality. They have it all messed up. It doesn't matter what everyone around you says about sexuality or divorce or, or anger or lust. It matters what God says if you're a person who wants to follow after God because this is the way the righteous people live. Let's talk about that phrase, certificate of divorce. And, and by the way, I'm going to bounce around a lot today. I don't like to put a lot of verses on the screens, and let me tell you why. Maybe you've been at churches that puts everything up. Here's the problem. When we put every verse on the screen, you don't look in your Bibles, okay? So this is a Bible church. I want you to bring a Bible. It can be on your phone. You can be more advanced than I am. I like a book. But you can bring your phone, your iPad. you got a Bible right in front of you. We want you to learn the Bible, okay? So we're going to move around a little bit today. What is a certificate of divorce? How do you get one? And what does it mean to give your wife one? What this is talking about, I want you to turn your Bibles back to Deuteronomy. Okay, that's the fifth book in your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. First five books of your Bible is written by Moses. It's called the Pentateuch. That word penta means five. Tuch means scrolls. First five scrolls of your Bible. Pentateuch. All right. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 24 and figure out what certificate of divorce means. Deuteronomy 24. Love to hear that sound in church. You get a church that you don't hear that, go somewhere else. All right? We don't read from a book that a man writes. We read from the book that God wrote. Deuteronomy 24, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some inadequacy in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs out of the house. So what we have here is we have a man and a woman married. This man has found some inadequacy in his wife and he writes her a certificate of divorce and sends her out the door. Look at the next verse. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife. So whatever we know about certificate of divorce, one thing we do know that if you were given a certificate of divorce, it did not mean that you could not remarry. In this culture, it meant that you could remarry. Okay? Now, let me, let me explain a little bit the certificate of divorce. The certificate of divorce was God's provision because men can be evil toward women. The certificate of divorce was God's way of protecting women. God's intent for marriage, God's plan for marriage, is that divorce is never an option. Okay? Till death do us part. But when you get to Deuteronomy 24, and there's sin after sin after sin after sin, what was happening is these men were taking their wives, and they would find some inadequacy in her. They would find something they didn't like about her. And they would literally send them out, and they would be left to go on their own. Now, the problem is in this culture, if you're a woman sent out without a certificate of divorce, no man's ever going to remarry you. You're either going to become a prostitute or you're literally going to starve to death. And God says, no, if men are going to take care of women, I'm going to take care of women, and I'm going to make sure these women are provided for. So God gave a law through Moses that if you were to send your wife away out of your hardness of heart, you were to give them a certificate of divorce. This was a piece of paper you literally hand them. They walk out, and they could actually get remarried. Another man could come along and say, you've got a certificate of divorce. You're not married right now. I will marry you, and I will take care of you. It was a provision of mercy for women. Look at the next verse, verse 3. And the latter man hates her. This is his second husband. Now, this may be a bad woman, but we're going to assume it's not. <laughs> and the latter man hates her and writes her certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house. Or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife. So he gives you two scenarios. She gets remarried. She has a certificate of divorce from the first husband. The second husband marries her and either sends her away with a certificate of divorce or he just dies. Either way, she's free to remarry again. Look at the next verse, verse 4. Then her former husband who sent her away, that's the first husband, it's like a soap opera, who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. So here's what God is saying, okay? And I'm just trying to bring the cookies down as low as we can on this part of Deuteronomy 24. What God is saying is, I don't like the way men are treating women. Men are sinful. They just they get a wife. They don't like something about them. They send them away. It's kind of the way we date now. You see one little thing you don't like, you send them away. And so you send these women away. They die or they become prostitutes. 
And so God says, I'm going to protect the women out of the gift of mercy. There's something called certificate of divorce. You have to send them away. They can get remarried and another person can take care of them. Okay, we, this culture was one that women were not getting their PhDs and their master's degrees. They weren't reading and writing. They were being taken care of by men. And so what he's also saying is if that husband, the second husband sends you away or he dies, you're free to remarry. But you can't go back to the first husband. Why is that? Because God is making a statement to men here. You're not going to treat women like cattle. You're not going to send them out like livestock and change your mind. No, I think I want her back. You're not going to treat them like products. They're people. They're people made in the image of God, just like men, just like women, co-equal, co-shares of the inheritance of God together. So that's what they're talking about in Matthew chapter 5. Okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to go to another passage. Go to the end of your Old Testament. There's a book called Malachi. Okay? It's the last book in your Old Testament. If you hit Matthew, you've gone too far, just back up one, Malachi. That's where your sticky pages are in your Bible that you never read before, okay? You need to read Malachi. It's a great book. And get to heaven one day, you'll be embarrassed. Like, what do you think about my book? I didn't read it. <laughs> so here's what he does in Malachi. The first chapter, he's talking to the southern kingdom. Another word for that in your Old Testament is Judah. And he's saying, Judah, you need to repent or blessings going to be taken away. You need to repent. And so the first part of Malachi is talking to the priests. If you got bad preachers, you're going to have bad followers of Christ. we got bad preachers. He's calling the preachers, the priests, to repent. Then he gets to chapter 2 of Malachi, and he says, I've got another issue you guys aren't doing well. Look with me in Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. And the second thing you do, and by the way, the, the lack of blessing right now for this culture was drought. Historically, it's been proven during this time, they're going through an incredible drought. Also in your Old Testament, the way God would bring uh, lack of blessing or a curse when someone wasn't walking with him was they would, he would just hold the rain back, right? So, and the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. So they're saying, we are going to the temple, we're offering up our sacrifices, we're pleading for rain, we're pre uh, pleading for blessing again, and God's not hearing us. Look at the next verse. They say, why is he not doing anything? But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So God says, the problem and the reason I'm not letting it rain is because I got a problem with the way you're treating each other as spouses. Men, the way you're treating your wives is holding back the blessings of God in your life. You made a covenant vow for richer, for poor, in health and sickness, till death do us part. And then the next verse, he says, I was there when you made the covenant. Verse um, 15, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And, and what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. The reason God says, I was there when you made that covenant vow, and the reason I let you guys come together so you could have godly children and you can continue to live a gospel life in front of a world that needs me. That's the purpose of why you guys are together, to make the gospel better. You're clear on the gospel together than you'd ever be apart. You guys come together, and I was there when you made your covenant vow. And then he says, and what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring, so guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. If you have an NIV, an NAS, some other translations, verse 16 says, God hates divorce. What does it mean when he says that he will cover your garment with violence? When a Jewish man would marry a Jewish woman at the ceremony, symbolically, the man would take off his coat, his outer garment, his cloak, and he would symbolically take his coat off, and he would put it around his wife. It was a picture of love, protection. I will take care of you. I will honor you. What is mine is now yours. You come under my protection. The Bible also talks about when a, when a person becomes a Christian, they come under the wings of God. It's the same picture, the same symbol. And what God is saying is this, that garment that you took symbolically on a covenant and you put around your wife and now you're treating her with evilness and with violence, now I'm going to put my garment of violence on you. 
It's God's way of saying through the prophet Malachi that when you divorce your wife and you treat her faithlessly, that you're teeing up against God. It's you versus God. And I got to tell you, my friend, God's always going to win. I remember when I was playing football as a young age and we were, we were um, practicing. And I remember there was a guy on my football team named Chris Patton. Chris is a little famous, at least in the southeast. He won the U.S. amateur uh, golf title when, when, when he was coming. And he played golf at Clemson. And, and, and he's over 300 pounds. He's a big dude. He was over 250 in fifth grade. <laughs> right? And I was probably about a buck 40 wet. And so we had this drill where two guys would lay on the ground and the coach would blow his whistle and you pop up and you just hit each other. And what would happen is we'd have half the team in one line, the other half the team in the other line, and you hear the whistle blow, you pop up and hit whoever's in front of you, you never knew who it was. But then I would see as Chris got closer to the front of the line, everybody would start shuffling on the other side so they wouldn't have to go against Chris. And here's what God is saying through Malachi. You're about to tee off with the creator of the universe if you don't hear what I'm telling you, and you're going to lose. Now I want you to turn your Bibles with me one book over back to Matthew. Go to chapter 19. Probably, I think, one of the best texts in your Bibles on this issue of marriage and divorce, and we're going to learn a little bit more what was going on in this culture. You guys follow me? Yeah. Okay, Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him, that's Jesus, and tested him by asking. And anytime you see the word Pharisees and testing, they're trying to get him in a, in a debate of words so he'll have to take a side and they can kind of condemn him for it. The Pharisees came to him and tested him, asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for what? Any cause. You see what's happened? It went from... Deuteronomy 24, because of the hard hardness of men, that they would give certificates of divorce for an indecency, the Pharisees during the time of Jesus had moved that so far on to the point of saying that you can divorce your wife for any cause. If you just feel like it, you just leave her. And so they're trying to get Jesus pulled into this century-old debate that they've been having. And they're going to try to get him to take one side or the other. By the way, there was two camps. There was a conservative school of Jewish thought and a very liberal school of Jewish thought. The liberal school of Jewish thought thought that when Moses made that exception in Deuteronomy 24, that an indecency can be anything. They said that if your wife were to burn your food, you can write her a certificate of divorce. If your wife just got older and wasn't so pretty, you write her a certificate of divorce, get a newer model. If your wife said something, and I'm not making these up. These are real things that they really taught. If your wife says something negative or unkind about your parents, you could write her out. Now, if that's true, pretty much every woman would be divorced, right? Right? And so then there was a, a conservative school of thought who taught, no, it's just for the exception. Indecency in the Hebrew means sexual or sexual impropriety or indecency. She has done something sexually immoral. And that's the exception that Moses is talking about. So they're trying to pull Jesus into this debate. Let's go back to it. He answered, have you not read? And I love Jesus. He never answers a question. He just kind of poses another question. He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? What's Jesus doing? He's going back not to Deuteronomy 24. He's going back to Genesis 2. Let's forget Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy 24. Let's go back to the original intent of marriage. He says, have you not heard or has it not been said that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And notice that's in quotation marks. He's quoting directly from Genesis 2, verse 6. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus doesn't answer the question. He's like, well, here's what God's intent for marriage. It's a divinely appointed appointment for two people to come together, and it's till death do you part. And what God, once God has brought them together, a divinely appointed union, a physical union happens. The man and the woman come together, and they're made one flesh. It's a physical union. So it's a divine union, a physical union, and it's a permanent a union. And so what Jesus is saying is this. The only reason Moses ever even gave an exception is because of your stubbornness and your hard-heartedness and your sin. But God's original design was a man and a woman shall come together. When you go back and read the creation account, what, you guys remember we did Genesis? Yeah. You go back and do the creation account, 
He says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But one thing, it's not good that man's alone. I'll create for him a helpmate. Not above him, not below him, but a helpmate to come alongside. And someone who he can love and she can love and they can do life together. Let's go to verse 7. They want to take it back to Deuteronomy 24. They said to him, why then did Moses, and what's the word they use? Command. Did Moses command to give a to divorce your wife? No, he permitted it. The command was the certificate of divorce. Look what they say. Why did then Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Moses never commanded you to send your wife away. He gave an exception based on the hard-heartedness and the sin that was in men's hearts. Look at verse 8. I love how Jesus handles knuckleheads. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the get beginning, it was not so. Ultimately, every divorce comes from hardness of heart. It's maybe both people have a hard heart, or maybe one person in the situation, but every divorce situation comes from a hardness of heart. What, how do you define hardness of heart? Hardness of heart, for example, can be someone says, he's wrong, I'm right. She's the one who did this, I'm innocent. But, but didn't you do some things to contribute? Yeah, but you don't know what it's like living with her. If you understood living with her, you'd understand why I did what I did. And we take no action. I'm good. They're bad. It's their fault. It's a hardness of heart. And I've been in, I've been in situations where I've had a couple, then you see the hardness of heart. And someone's sitting there, and they, they, they've sinned against their spouse. And the person who has sinned against their spouse is crying and confessing and repenting. And I'll look at the one that's hard in heart, and I'll say, they are sorry. They are asking for your forgiveness. And I will look at that hard person, and they'll go, I don't care how much they cry. I don't care how much they ask. I will never forgive them. They are dead to me. Marriage is a permanent physical union that can only be broken by a physical cause. And the Bible gives two physical causes to break a marriage. Death and sexual immorality. You see, we've created a little phrase here. We don't use certificate of divorce anymore. We've created another phrase in our culture. Irreconcilable differences. Right? I got news for you. If you're not married, I got news for you. Every marriage has irreconcilable differences. Because you got two sinners who can't even reconcile their own sin colliding with someone else's sin, and every marriage has two people bringing baggage into that sin. Thank you, Mom and Dad. Every marriage has irreconcilable differences. But we've come up with a phrase like certificate of divorce, and this is the phrase where it takes us. I just wasn't happy. Wouldn't God want me to be happy? I just want to be happy. Let me tell you something. God is not worried about your happiness. God's worried about your holiness. And we've bought into a lie saying sin makes you happy and holiness is boring. Could it be that obeying God will actually bring the joy that your heart longs for, but instead you're going to go marry another knucklehead and you're going to be miserable again? Why is the divorce rate for the second time getting married 76%? Because people are trying to find something in a human being that only Jesus Christ can do in your life. And so Jesus is saying this is a permanent union. It's not Divorce isn't a, isn't a first option. It's a final option. It's, a, it's the last option you should ever think about. And we're so quick to do it here. And here's the problem. The church is just like everybody else. Marriage is the number one illustration the Bible uses for what the gospel looks like. And we are just like everybody else. And then we wonder why the world doesn't get Jesus. Because we don't get marriage. Look at verse 9. And I say to you, and I'll say this too before I get there. I got a good wife. She's got an awesome husband. Marriage is hard. When you're both praying and loving the Lord and working hard and serving, it is hard. Honestly, I don't see how anyone stays together outside of Christ. Verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another 
commits adultery. Here's what Jesus says. And that's why I call this series Violent Liberation. Jesus is exploding into the church and exploding out of our hearts. All the things we think are okay because our culture tells us this. And Jesus comes in and says, the only reason you break a physical covenant is because someone physically dies or they physically break the covenant physically with someone else. Jesus says the same thing. But well, pastor, our culture doesn't believe that. I understand. We're Christians in a culture that's not Christian. So don't think the culture is going to get this. They're not. Your friends are going to tell you crazy. Your friends, some of your Christian friends give you the worst advice. God would want you to be happy. God doesn't want you. You need to be real careful when you speak for God to someone else. And Proverbs says this, that there's always another side of every matter. Have you ever heard someone, one of your friends is either filing for divorce or getting divorced and your heart just breaks for them and you run to their rescue and you get furious at the other person and then later down the road you kind of hear the other side of the story and you're like, wow, I never heard that other side of that story. Welcome to pastoral counseling. (laughs) Every person you talk to is going to manipulate their story to make them look like the victim and the other person look like the enemy. There is always, not sometimes, always two sides to every story. So Jesus gives this response. Look at verse 10. The disciples freak out. Disciples said to him, if such the case is of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. If you're telling me that I've got to stay with the same woman, no matter what happens, no matter how crazy she gets, no matter how mean he is at times, I've got to stay with this person unless death is the physical break or sexual immorality, it's better not to get married. Might be the smartest things the disciples ever said. And what tells me his disciples got what Jesus was saying. This is a violent liberation. Look at verse 11. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. That there's Christians. Not Christians aren't going to get this. Verse 12. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive this. Now, we don't have eunuchs running around anymore, but what we do have is we have folks who God may call to be single. We have folks that God may say, you know what? There are some people that I've counseled, you don't need to get married. You will wreck it. You need to stay single. You need to deal with your own sin before you marry someone else because your sin will destroy her or destroy him. I want you to know, too, that we're not a a church that says there's never biblical grounds for divorce. I believe there are biblical grounds for divorce. I'm going to share three with you this morning. I believe there are times for biblical grounds for divorce. And even in saying that, it is never the first option. It is always the last option. It is always painful. It is always tragic. And it's not God's desire. It's not God's will. He wants you to stay married. He wants you to reconcile. And I've ha- I, we have people in our church right now that are walking through affairs with one of the spouses. And let me tell you this. It is just as many women walking away from their husbands and their kids right now than, than, than the men are. Just as many affairs with women right now going on as men. This is not just a man thing. And I sat down with couples, and I have couples saying, she had an affair on me. He had an affair on me. And I'll tell you what it takes to reconcile that. This is what it's going to take. It's going to take the person who's been hurt to deeply forgive that person. And that's going to take tears and time. You can't just say, I forgive you, and you're not going to struggle anymore. It's going to take tears and time. And it's going to take the person who has offended the other person to repent with tears and, 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 and humility and to sit in that situation as long as it takes for that offended person to get through it. And it's got to take two people to do that. It's going to take a long time. Sin makes you stupid. We are always one dumb mistake away from blowing it. Sin is fun for the moment, and then the wreckage come, and the wreckage is never worth the pleasure that the sin brought on the front end. So let me talk about the biblical grounds for divorce. Number one, and it's this, this one isn't technically divorce, but it's when the marriage ends through death. Let me share a couple of verses with you on this. Because when the marriage ends through death, people said, well, I was, I was married to a believer. He died. Can I get remarried? Is that biblical? Okay. Yes, it is. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 2, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. It puts a caveat in there, only in the Lord. Meaning, if you've done the right things and made the right decisions, you married in the Lord, and, and he dies or she dies, don't screw everything up and go marry a non-believer. Marry a believer. Marry in the Lord. And guys, let me say this for, for the single adults here at Austin Ridge. 
That is why who you date and how you date is so important for the rest of your life. Because I know folks are in activity sexually as single adults, and they're going, when I get married, I'll just stop all that. Let me tell you, if you struggle with pornography before you get married, you're going to struggle with pornography after you get married. If you struggle with sleeping around with a bunch of people before you get married, you're going to struggle wanting to sleep around with a bunch of people after you get married. Marriage changes nothing because that's who you are. And so if you're practicing those things now, you need to deal with your sin, put your sin to death before you marry someone else and destroy their life through your sin. And that's why it's so important who you date. I've said this before. Marrying the wrong person is like taking a loaded revolver, putting it in their hand, and placing the gun on your temple with their hand on the trigger. There is no demon in hell that cannot destroy your life quicker than being married to the wrong person. So death gets you out of marriage, and you can remarry. Number two. And by the way, the Bible also teaches that there will be no marriage in heaven. See, marriage was given to people on earth. It's an earthly institution because we have needs. We have intimacies. We have emotional needs. We, we need our needs met. When you get to heaven, you're not going to have any needs. Now, Pastor, that makes me sad because I want to be remarried to my spouse. You, I think you'll know your spouse. I think you'll be intimate with your spouse. You'll, you'll be close to your spouse. But there will be no marriage because it's not needed in heaven. Number two, I believe adultery also is a biblical reason for divorce. It's breaking the covenant law of two flesh becoming one. It doesn't mean adultery is committed that you should get a divorce because you have a reason biblically to get it. Reconciliation is still God's desire. Forgiveness is still God's desire. Some of the greatest redemption stories I know in this church are people who there's been an affair in the marriage and then they're back together and they're discipling other married couples in this church because they were willing to be noble, spiritual people. And I'm not saying if you get a divorce because of an affair, you're not being spiritual or noble. I'm just saying to stick through it is a very noble, hard, thing to do. And again, to my single friends, who you marry is the second most important decision you'll ever make. The first most important decision you'll ever make is which God you're going to serve. There's pretty much two options on the God things. We can throw Buddha and we can throw all these Hindu gods, but here's the, here's the two gods, you or Jesus. That, that's pretty much, are you going to worship yourself or are you going to worship the one true God who created you and who owns you and yet you want to own him? And I see this repeated over and over and over. People get married, they get a divorce, they have kids, and you think, Here, here's another lie. We're going to get divorced, but we're going to be good friends, and we're going to be good parents, and it's not going to affect our kids. It is a lie from the pit of hell. That is why I shared last week, more kids that are growing up in broken homes are more likely to have a broken home because they don't know how to deal with conflict. They just, hey, if it gets tough, you just leave. That's what dad did. And we think, we'll just be good parents, we'll just be good friends, and everything will be okay. It's never over. They'll think the divorce ends it. The divorce just starts it. Then you've got to deal with holidays, you've got to deal with in-laws, you've got to deal with college education, you've got to deal with you know, babysitters, you've got to deal with weekends and who gets who and where, and it just continues. It is a wreck mess. Talk to someone who's been through it. It is a mess. It is so painful and so difficult. So what does it mean when Jesus says except for the case of sexual immorality. And if you divorce someone outside of that case, you're causing someone else to be an adulterer. What does that mean? That word sexual immorality there in Matthew that we looked at in chapter 5, there's two words in your Bible for sexual immorality. One word is a physical act of a physical affair. That's not the word that Jesus uses there. He uses a Greek word called porneia. We get our English word from porneia. We get the English word pornography. I believe what Jesus is saying, that there is a, Exception in the Bible for divorce that's not just a physical affair, but is sexually immoral, sexual immorality happening in the marriage. I think someone you can be married to, it, they're looking at porn and they just won't stop. They won't repent. They're going to continue to look at porn. They're going to continue to go to strip clubs. They're going to continue to, to flirt with coworkers. They're going to continue to live this lifestyle. And I believe Jesus is saying, except for, he is saying, porneia. Sexual immorality, that you have sexually abandoned the covenant that you've made with one woman with one man. Now, these are tough situations. And let me say this. You are never the best to decide whether your reason for divorce is biblical or not. You're always going to see your reason through the lens of your circumstances. That's why pastors are here. You come, you sit down with pastors, you sit down with counselors, and they can look at you unbiasedly and say, you know what? I think you have a biblical grounds for divorce. 
or I don't think you have a biblical grounds for divorce. A lot of people won't come to pastor because they don't want to hear it because they've already made their mind up, my grounds is biblical. Everyone thinks they have biblical grounds for divorce. Everybody thinks they have reason, and everyone thinks they're going to be happy, happy afterwards. Another condition for grounds of divorce is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I don't have time to go to the text, but write this text down. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 16. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 16. The other grounds for divorce that the Bible gives is that when a non-Christian leaves a Christian in a marriage. When a non-Christian leaves a Christian in a marriage. Let me explain what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was a jacked up church. I love when people say, we should be the first century church. The first century church is just as messed up as we are. And so the church at Corinth is messed up, and he comes in, he's sharing the gospel with people, and people are repenting, and then they're coming to Christ. But the problem is some of these people that are coming to Christ are already in marriages. And so a lot of the situation in the Corinth is you've got someone who comes to Christ in a marriage, but they're still married to a non-Christian. They have a mixed marriage. And so Paul is instructing these people through the fact that they're in a mixed marriage what they're to do. Because the Christians are starting to say, Paul, I love Jesus and my husband doesn't love Jesus. I want out so I can be married in the Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. He says it. You can go read the verses yourself. He says, if you are in a mixed marriage, a non-Christian marriage, and that non-Christian wants to stay with you, you do not have biblical grounds to divorce them. You stay with him for the reason, he gives you the reason, so that through your testimony, he or she and your children may come to know Christ. They may come to know the Lord. You are the evangelistic light that God has placed in that family. You stay right there if that non-Christian wants to stay with you. And what Paul is also saying is this, and I've seen it statistically, and I don't mean to discourage you, rarely does that happen. I know girls think, I'm going to marry him, I'll change him. All right? You're not the Holy Spirit, you're not good at being the Holy Spirit. You marry someone who you want them to be, not someone who you think you can change into something else. And so what I've seen is, I've seen it happen a little better with men. A man's a Christian, a wife's a non-Christian. I've seen it happen more statistically where a man is reading his Bible, praying, being humble, giving, being generous, loving his wife, being tender, listening, dealing with conflict well, and the wife's heart just opens up because ultimately God has created women's hearts to respond to a man leading spiritually. But I've also seen a lot of times with women, and it's not the same with men, when the man's a non-Christian. I don't want to discourage you if you're in that situation. I'm just saying statistically it doesn't happen as much. The point is, marry in the Lord. You're like, great, I'm already married. That's not, that's not good. If they want to stay with you, Paul says, you stay in that marriage and you be a witness. Now, Paul also says if you're in the marriage and your non-Christian spouse looks at you one day and says, you know what, I didn't sign up for this, all this Jesus stuff, I don't like it, it's not me, and they'll say something like this, you used to be fun when we were perverted and sinful and now you're not fun anymore? I want out. I am leaving. What Paul says in that passage is if that non-Christian leaves you, you are no longer, he says, enslaved to the marriage and you can leave that marriage. You can go and be divorced and you can remarry because that non-Christian wants out. Okay? So go back and look at that passage as well. Again, for time's sake, I'm sorry I can't go there with you. And when he starts that passage off, there's something that will throw you off a little bit. Paul says, I, not the Lord, am saying this. And that's been misinterpreted. A lot of people read that and say, Paul's just giving his opinion here, so it really doesn't matter. That's not what Paul's saying. What Paul's saying is this. Jesus did not say this prior in his teaching while on earth, but through the Holy Spirit, he has illumined me through my apostolic authority, and I write as the Lord would have spoken. That's how authoritative Paul's letters are, we believe, as Christians. So here's what I want you to hear. I'm begging you, if you're a Christian, do not marry a non-Christian. Here's what I hear from the ladies. But he's fun. He will destroy your life or you will compromise. Please do not marry a non-Christian. It's very hard. It's very sad. And I want to give you one other example that Paul talks about in that passage. He talks about an example, I believe, that you're married to someone who proclaims to be a believer and they become, well, I'll use the biblical word, they become apostate. 
You're walking through there. They're loving the Lord. We're, we're committed. We love Jesus. And then somewhere in the marriage, they say, you know what? I don't love Jesus anymore. That's a very difficult situation. But I believe at that point, they become an apostate and they want out. It's the same rules under what Paul is saying at the rest of the, chapter 7, that that's a non-Christian regardless of prior proclamation because he's not walking with the Lord. Again, these are hard, unclear situations at times. But I believe the bulk of our divorces happen because of irreconcilable differences. I just don't like them anymore. I, I, I never loved them. Or, or she clips her toenails in the bed and it drives me crazy. <laughs> or she's looking older and I want a newer model. And what Jesus is saying is, I will now put a garment of violence against you. You want to tee off with me? This will set me off. And I will take away the blessing out of your life. This is serious stuff. So let me give you a summary. Divorce provision in the Bible, marital unfaithfulness, desertion of a believer by an unbelieving spouse, and of course, death. Folks, that's what I see the Bible gives as biblical grounds for divorce. Remarriage is permittable when one's mate is guilty of sexual immorality, is unwilling to repent. One is free to remarry when a believer is deserted by an unbelieving spouse. One is free to remarry through death. I'm going to add one more to that. This is my opinion. It's the only thing I've said this morning is my opinion. I think everything else is clear. It is my opinion that if you get married and you believe when you're married... Okay, let me start back over. I believe that someone is married and divorced before becoming a believer. They're married, they get a divorce, then they become a believer. I believe, based on 1 Corinthians 5.17, that when you become a converted person, the old is gone, the new has come, you're a new creature in Christ. I believe someone who is married and divorced and then becomes a believer can biblically get remarried again. Okay? That's my opinion. That's the way I would counsel, because I believe... Every sin in your life, including divorce, including unfaithfulness, has been wiped away. Folks, adultery is not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin in Scripture is a lifelong rejection against Jesus Christ. It's a terrible sin. It leaves wreckage. And some of you right now, men and women, are thinking about doing it. Are you doing it right now? And you're listening to me preach every week. And I'm telling you, you are playing with fire, and it will wreck your life. It's already wrecking your life. But again, I want to be clear, divorce is never God's desire. It's a concession to human weakness. It's a concession to sin. I was reading a story, this the illustration this past week encouraged me. I thought I'll share it with you guys. There was a couple I was reading about. They've been married 63 years, and he died. I don't know why. It seems like men die first. I'm going to outlive my wife. I already told her. But he died, 63 years. And every day of 63 years of marriage, every day he would come home from work and bring her one rose. And there'd be days he'd come in, he'd forget to give it, where's my rose? Oh, here it is, honey. He died the very next day. She hears, knock on the door. In her grief, she comes to the door. There's a gentleman standing there with a rose. He says, I'm supposed to give this to you. Walks away, there's a note attached to the rose. The note says, honey, when I made a covenant vow to you till death do us part, I also meant an end to eternity. And as long as you're still alive, I've made a, 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 a guarantee with this floor is they're going to bring you a rose every day until the day you die. Do you know of anyone else in the scriptures who made a covenant vow with you not just unto death but into eternity? His name is Jesus Christ. And folks, all of us have been unfaithful to him and he has forgiven us and he has shed mercy on us and he has given grace to us. And he continues to be patient with us. And Jesus one day will present the church, his bride, to, to, to God the Father without wrinkle, without blemish. Folks, noble people fight for their marriages. The world just gives up. I want Austin Riz to be known as a people of great marriages. Some of you need to take from this sermon, you need to have a conversation with your spouse. Some of you need to confess some things. Some of you need to get in counseling. We've got something coming up. It's called divorce care. Some of you need to go to divorce care. You may think, well, I was divorced three years ago. It won't help me now. It will help you now. We're starting divorce care on April 26th. I would encourage you to go to it. It is a, a great program with great curriculum. You need to walk through. It's a 12-step, 12 12, not 12-step, 12 12-week 12 program. We'd love for you to go to divorce care. You can go to austinridge.org backslash divorce care and sign up for it. Please do. 
Our staff is here to help you. And by, by the way, I can't help all of you, so don't say, I've got to I gotta meet with Brad. We've got great pastors. We've got great directors here. They are awesome. I only hire people who are qualified, okay? And by the way, after anger and lust and divorce, I'm leaving town today for the next five days. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but I want you to know, guys, I love you guys. I love this church. We're lug nuts together. There is no sin that you can commit that God's grace is not deeper still. There's no mercy that you can go so far away that it can't still envelop your life. I want to encourage you to get some help. Your marriage is the number one illustration the Bible uses to show what the gospel means. And we wonder why the world's not attracted to Jesus. It's because they're not seeing a clear gospel because our marriages are horrible. I want to encourage us to be men and women of great marriage. You with me? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for the difficulties that most everything in life is not black and white. There's a lot of grays. But Father, there's certain things that you say are black and white. The fact that you hate divorce, the fact that your desire, your intent is that we will be able to say till death do we part. Father, I pray for my friends at Austin Ridge that maybe they've gone through a painful divorce, maybe they're in a process, maybe they're in a sin right now that's about to cause a divorce. I pray, Father, your grace would overwhelm them. Your mercy would convict. Father, your heart would beat in ours. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray.